But we're going we're gonna to be we're going we're gonna to be reading out of Isaiah chapter fifty-eight. Uh, most of you Bible scholars know that is your uh, uh, what they call the fasting chapter, uh, and I'm not talking about fasting today because I know you're not going to fast today, nor tomorrow, probably the next day or the next day. So. So I'm not going to even I'm not going to belabor that, but I, there are some things I feel uh, we will look at this morning. I know last week we was in the knowing, and a lot of times when you make those kind of statements, uh, I have one of the ladies in one of the class ask me about healing. She asked me about. Uh, and I was trying to explain to her about knowing and how to know how to perceive God. Because knowing is perceiving God. That's what is when you see the word know, it means there's a perception. Not just a perception, but there's a relationship. You know, you go back in the beginning, and when it says that Adam knew E. So it's talking about more than just intellectual knowledge. Talking about more than just logic, it's talking about a perception of intimacy with God. In order for you to really know, you have to become intimate with your situation in God. But today, we're going to talk about what's in your garden. Maybe that'll help us too. In Isaiah 58 and 9, it begins, it said, Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, and put it forth of the finger and speak in vanity. And basically the only thing it's saying, first of all, the yoke is what is used to carry a burden. You remember what Jesus said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. And so there's a yoke that you carry that you got to put away, and there's a yoke he give that... Is light. The putting forth of the finger, the speaking vanity. If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity. Thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bone. Thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters fell not. And they that shall be of thee shall, be, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise, raise up the foundation of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairers of the breach and the restorers of path to dwell in. And of course, we realize that was prophetic. We realize that Isaiah was speaking by way of the Holy Ghost uh, as a prophecy that was something to come to the people of Israel. I want to talk about seeds because... Everything, seed is another word for potential. Matter of fact, I just had this discussion yesterday with my daughter. She is trying to explain to me the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian. And I asked her, could she eat meat? She said, no, I think a vegetarian can eat fish. So I asked her, I said, is it okay to eat an egg? Because it's a baby chicken. She said, I can eat eggs. I said, but you're eating a baby chicken. But anyway, <laughs> I just want to make sure I got all my stuff right. But See, and the reason I said it because an egg is potentially a what? That's a chicken. Right. And everything that a chicken is supposed to be is inside that egg. All the potential. The feathers, the beak, the claw, chicken feet, all that is in that egg. But 
And at any time there is a seed, whether it be acorn, peanut, corn, everything that that corn is going to be always starts from a seed. Everything that, you know, she said, well, that's the reason why a lot of people today get in this thing about whether a baby is the embryo or a baby. No, it's a person. Simple. They know ifs and buts about it. It's a person. So you can satisfy your mind by redefining it, but it's still a person. Okay? And they want to relieve you of the thought of it being a lot by degrading it, by saying some scientific term about it, that this is an embryo. No, it's a person, you know, at a different stage of life, like we all are. Different stage of life. So we, we, but, but what is planted in us is what produces in us. And see, the Bible talk called the word is a seed, right? And so we know that in Matthew chapter 13, he talks about the sower, in the parable of the sower, he said, he also that received his seed among the thorns is he who heareth the word and the cares of this world, the secretness of riches, choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. In other words, now, a seed can only grow where the atmosphere is conducive. You can take a seed, a corn seed, matter of fact, you got seeds out of the pyramids right now. It's been there since they built the pyramid. And they've been put in jars or whatever. They never had the right amount of moisture. All the other things that's conducive to make a seed grow. And so a seed can last as long as you want it to last, as long as you don't put it in a place or an environment where that it can grow. And it's even the word of God, which is also a seed. It will only grow if it's in the environment that's conducive for that type of growth. Just nod your head like this. Isn't it? Okay, all right. I want to make sure I'm getting this across. Because it's important to understand the power of a seed. Matter of fact, I, I had read one where they say if you can take a small mustard seed, grass seed, or any kind of seed and can drill a hole into a granite block, and drop that seed in that granite block and give it a little bit of water and something else it can use to sprout, it will break that rock of granite open. That's how powerful a seed is. And so many of us, well, not many of us, all of us, from the day we came into this world, people have planted seed in our life. Right? Many understand that every seed that was planted in us was not always a good seed, but it was a seed, and we did probably produce something from that seed. Whether it was good or bad, that seed would produce because it is, it is the, the law of nature. That is a law that no matter what it is, if you put it in the right place to grow, it will grow to its full potential if it's in the right environment. And one of the things that happened is that most of the seeds that was planted in us before we came to God didn't help us. Matter of fact, it hurt us. It, it, it put us at a, a, a grave disadvantage. And if you'll remember back, we taught one on transformation. We've taught on how the mind has to be changed. Well, the mind has to become like a garden where it sees a planet of God that can grow. And, and what happened, some of the seeds that we got put in us early was called fear. Many of us learned fear before we learned anything else. We learned how to be afraid before we learned how to believe. You know, they had you always scared of everything. You know, you know, uh, uh, 
Uh, I think m my wife, she loves, she's scared of dogs. And I always remember when we'd be with the kids. She see a dog, man, she started grabbing that buggy, went around, said, baby, don't run. Don't, don't even try that. I said, don't teach the kids to be scared of dogs, because all dogs ain't bad. Right? So, but we have, we created a lot of fears from people that put those seeds in our life to be afraid of certain things. And we became afraid. And so most of the fears that we have was birthed by seeds people put in us, and that in turn uh, gave us a, 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 a fearfulness of everything. You know, you know the sad part about this is that I, I, I believe that my mother, before I knew God, I thought she was. And I feared her. <laughs> And I feared her like I feared God. Matter of fact, I was more afraid of her than I was God. Because I didn't even know who God was. Okay? Now, the only sad part about that is that fear just escalates. It becomes good. I think there is a certain reverence or, or that we owe to parents. They ought to be feared. <laughs> but if fear is not taught right, then it becomes a real phobia and it puts people into bondage. And matter of fact, is that you, most people today, uh, when it comes to God, is because somehow the way the Lord has been presented to us, not as a loving father, but as a mean dad that's ready to whoop us every day. That fear, see, you know, my kids were so scared of me, they wouldn't even come to me. Except for one. <laughs> Except for one. I only had one child that was bold enough <laughs> to come to me. Now the rest of them have comes back and hey, go tell dad. No, no, you go. No, no, no not me. No. And, and, and see now, you know, really, one sense I felt good, but then all of a sudden I realized one thing. My kids are afraid of me. Now what have I done to make them afraid of me like that? That, most, that most of them haven't had about two or three whoopings in their life. All together, they probably, together they wouldn't even have a handful of whoopings. Okay? But they did see me whoop some others. <laughs> and I think that created something in them that I wasn't trying to create. I, want, I, didn't, I never want them to see discipline as being something that I'm mad and want to kill you. You know, I, I never want discipline. Matter of fact, this ain't even in the lesson, but I'm going to say this while we're here is that discipline is never about madness, it's about correction, all right? And so that's why when I see parents, only time they want to beat their kids is when they get mad. You're teaching the wrong thing. See, when I put my kids, I smile. I hug them. We may have problem eaters. <laughs> you know why? Because I don't want them to think because you're in trouble that I don't love you. I still love you. You understand? I don't want you to walk away thinking and being afraid. No. I'm going I'm to whoop you and smile at the same time and tell you it hurt me more than it hurt you. <laughs> and so what has happened is that many times is that we have the, the idea. Most Christian people today, and it may be not you, but most Christian people today do not believe they can obtain to the level that God wants them to be. And so instead of living in love, they live in fear of always failing God. 
Then what happens is then we do this brainstorming. And uh, what we do, we get to thinking, what can I do to make God love me more? And then we're fearful that I'm not going to do enough that he's going to love me enough. There is a parable, there is not a parable, but a phrase is called analysis is paralysis. And what happens, people want to analyze God and get paralyzed in the process because you can't analyze this. This is not something you analyze. And we'll sit down trying to analyze things in our mind, thinking of ways that we can do our own thing to help this situation. You know, and so then when that don't work, now we back square A, still fearful, see, because the, the flesh promotes its own thought. You ever think, you do it all the time, don't you? Now, don't, don't just look this way. This is not a quiz. If you had to measure most of your thinks and thoughts, thinking, thought patterns, how many of them would you say you know came from God? Just keep looking this way. Don't worry about it. How, how, how much of that thinking could you honestly say today, man, that was a God thought. But we do have them. And you will have them from time to time. You'll get a thought. You know it wasn't your thought. You knew it. Got to be God's thought. You will hope to God is God's thought. And so that mind, what this mind, our flesh mind promotes is thoughts by self-elevating them over the word of God. There are people that really believe that they know more about God than God knows about himself. Now, we don't say it like that. We don't say it like that, though. What we do, our action says it. God will say this, and you'll say, but I know this is this. But God will say one thing, but your thoughts will elevate you over the word of God, and you will deny what God says because of what you thought. Many, you, you know, you, you say things like, uh, I don't want to get in trouble this morning. Uh, Jesus said it's finished. What do you say? I know it is. So now, the but on the end of that is going to be your thoughts on how you think that he didn't mean what he said. Right? Now, it's not up to me to figure out if it's true. I've got to believe it's true because he said it's true. I have nothing else to measure God by but his word. Matter of fact, it's that when you begin to measure that, you, you can tell what's being planted in your garden by how you talk. Nothing can come out of you that's not already in you. All right? And so my conversation is what Tell you or anyone else what's in me. You know, how many of y'all heard this? I have, I know. I'm just going to say it. I am a sinner saved by grace. How many of y'all heard that? Huh? Heard it all your life, right? Now, this, this is going to be really mind-blowing. Number one. Do you know how many times the word saint is written in the Bible? 330 times. Do you know how many times unsaved people are called sinners in the Bible? 240 times. Do you know how many times saved people is called sinners in the Bible? Zero. Because he never called a saved person a sinner. 
Because he's already said some things about you that you have to believe. And most people would rather say, sound hopeless by saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, the Bible said, I am the righteousness of God. Is that what he said? Now, do I believe that? Then I need to quit saying I'm a sinner saved by grace because I am. What I was is one thing. What I am right now is not a sinner saved by grace. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I am a saint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The group of people he's talking to are those that was in Judaism and telling them now, you do this thing, you cannot inherit. They got to come from under all of that, get into the kingdom of God. When you get in the kingdom of God, you, you have a new identity and you're not identified by past. You're only identified by who you are now. Okay, so... When Paul goes into that discourse in Galatians, I think in chapter 5, when he talks about, uh, he talks about works of the flesh in one place, fruit of the spirit. There's other place he talks about uh, in Corinthians, I think. Uh, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom. Well, they couldn't inherit the kingdom at that time because the kingdom hadn't really come into fullness in the first place. But there's some things they had to do to get in the kingdom of God when it finally come into its fullness. They have to get rid of this, they gotta get rid of all that to be in the kingdom. But once now, if you notice in Corinthians, I think when he talks about the one man who had, young man who had his father's woman, wife, concubine. And one of the things that when you read that, discourse, I think, oh, in uh, 1 Corinthians, okay, I got an old folks moment. <laughs> but he, he talks about the young man who had his father's wife. And I don't think it was his mother. I think his father probably had remarried. And he said, and they were, no one was saying anything. But not one time did he go and call the man a sinner. Now what he did say, he said, now I'll tell you what. Turn such a one over to Satan so that his flesh can be buffeted and that, his, that the spirit be saved. So what he, what he done was this. What Paul done, instead of calling the man a sinner, he reminded the man of who he was. Remember what he said? He reminded him who he was in Christ. And so the same thing now is that our focus is not on the individual who they, their past, but in, we, our focus should be on who they are, remind people who they are in Christ now. And that's what his whole uh, uh, avenue was doing because in the day, church, you know what we had done? We would have reminded you who you were and not who you were in Christ. And so Paul's attack or Paul's way of dealing with that kind of stuff is reminding you who you are. If you don't know who you are, then you can't be what God wants you to be. If you don't identify with Christ, how can, if you don't identify who he say you are, then you have faith in yourself and not in him. Because it's not up to me to decide who I am. Right? Can you decide that? How you doing, boss? I ain't seen you in a long time. Glad to see you. All right. So... Many, you know, and, I, and I, I hate to make these statements because I know people take them the wrong way, but I can't have it. The truth is going to be the truth. I cannot run from that. We can't run from it. It ain't going to change because I want to change. I can't make God change his mind about what he says. You see, we talked about beginning about the fasting. See, sometimes we have, we have this idea that fasting gets us closer to God and what we'll begin to do is work at doing our fasting to get close to God. And that's not what God ever wanted you to think about. It's, first of all, you got to know you got God. If you have God, 
you, you are close to God because he's in you, right? So I don't fast to get more of God. Because if I fast to get more of God, then I'm saying he's, not, he's less in my life. And yet he's told me, I have given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. So for me to go into, it sounds like faith, but that's not faith. I am saying that I don't have enough of God. God said, you have all that you need. Now, who's telling the truth? I fast because of the presence of God. Now, I fast to bask in his presence, but I don't fast to get God or trying to get God. I already got him. I'm not trying to get him. No, matter of fact, he got me. He got me more than I got him. I, it's just me? Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'm just checking. See, he, he, got, he got me more than I got him. He the one picked me up first. He chose me, okay? I, I didn't, I know you said, well, you know, I, 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 I found the Lord. No, you didn't. You didn't never find him. You know why you couldn't find him? Because he never was lost. Hmm? So how did you find him? No, you were the one lost. So you were the one that needed to find him, and so God found you. What you done is responded to what God done by faith. You responded to his finding you. No man cometh unto God except. You do not ever wake up one day and eat the right cereal and decide to get saved. You're never going to wake up one day and say, you know what? Man, I've done good all week, so I know I'm going to get saved today. No, he ain't going to save you on that. But when he wants you, he draws you. When people come to God, it's because God drew them. Somebody said, well, yo, man, my life was turned upside down. I was out there in the goes. And I just said, well, I'm going to turn my life to God. Well, no, you didn't decide that. God may use the gutters to get you to wake up. But it wasn't your decision. You know, you the one I was in the world like that and things got bad. You know what I've done? I tried to make it bad get better I thought finding God was a little bit too serious for me I didn't really want that that I didn't want it that much I, I just want to get a have a bad day get over a bad day and get into something else amen but here is the most basic thing in God that we have to do is the one thing we run from what do you really have to do to get what God has for you? Go, go ahead. I heard you. I heard you. Go on. Shout it out to him. Because the devil don't think you know that, see? I have to tell you. Uh, you have to believe. Well, but we feel like if I fasted 50 days, that means I believe more. No, you believe more in what you were doing than what he's already done. And that becomes a real problem for you because if I go to God saying, trying to pull out this track in my little application, I tell God, well, God, you know what? I've done a Moses fast. I've done a Moses consecration. And I, and I fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I ain't had no water, nothing. I know, I know you're going to do this for me. But you never believe. You know, you never believe. All you had to do was just believe. Well, bro, wasn't that just too easy? Well, whoever told you it's supposed to be hard? Huh? Isn't it strange Jesus come, he does all the hard work? Huh? He does all the hard work so you can have it easy, but you won't take the hard work he done and discount and think that your hard work is better than his hard work. He carried the load. He took the beating. He wore the crown. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. No, no. <laughs> Let me write this up here. I do Believe <laughs> in fasting. Please do not erase that. 
And if that's on film, please put that on there because somebody's going to say, oh, you don't believe in fasting. Yes, I do. But I do really believe when God, and I believe fasting is good even if you weren't saved. Okay? If you, if you weren't even in church, fasting is good because it's healthy. But I think that every saint, you know, I, I don't have to call a fast. I just fast. I, I don't have to call one. It's, there are days I go I, it, all day long. Did I eat today? No, I didn't eat today. And there are other times when I am indulging all day and knowing I am indulging all day and ain't feeling guilty. Because I know God can work with my stomach full and he can work when it's empty. And so there's not anything like that going to hinder what God is doing. And so I'm not, I, I, I don't want to come off too rough, but there is a problem when you are thinking you're going to change God's mind because you did fast. If God calls you, it's just like if you had a situation in your life and God says, uh, he kind of like impress upon you. Go on a fast. Of course, we, we already got in our mind how many days that's going to be, see. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a fast. You know, you, you all ever hear people saying, I'm going to go on a 21-day fast or four-day fast. You don't ever hear that, do you? Man, I ain't heard that in so long. I ain't going to lie to you. I don't even talk to that myself. But if God calls me to that, it's going to be God. You see me go 40 days, it's going to be God. I know it's going to be God. It's got to be God. <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. On that, you know, I, I was listening to a religious program this morning. And, and, it, and it, it really, it's really heartbreaking to see how people can just do the scriptures and cause people uh, just, just stupid stuff they say, you know. Like uh, everybody's got a gimmick. everybody got a money gimmick. You know, uh, send me a... Uh, what kind of offering they said today? A different kind of offering. I ain't never even heard of that one before. And if you send that offering in, you know, God's going to bless you. And, and what we tell people is this. Now, here, here the thing is that a real true spirit of giving is not one of giving to get. All right? That's not a true spirit. And so I'm not going to manipulate God by sending my offering in this whatever seed offering they call it. Send your seed offering in. I just keep the seed offering in my pocket. If he can work it there, he can work it here too. I just say, Lord, that's seed. No, no, okay, it's a bee seed. <laughs> but what happened, people are so gullible because people are thinking with their minds, not with their heart, not with the spirit, and so to hear things like that, and it sounds better than a lottery ticket. And so you'll go and, 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 and do some things that sounded good, but basically, if you really understood the Spirit of God is in you, you'll never fall for the gimmicks. Those are nothing but gimmicks. If, if God's going to bless you, like the person sitting there telling you to send the money, I bet you they ain't sending that. You ought to call him up and say, you know, God spoke to me and told me if you send me about 2000 he He's going to bless your ministry where you ain't got to ask nobody for no more money. Huh? Isn't there somehow they can get you to do it, but they ain't doing it. They ain't. Call one of them up then. Call one of them up and says they want you to pour your money into that ministry. And then call them up and say, you know, I got a ministry and God told me to call you and ask you for a seed. And see what happened. Okay, I, I mean, I know this stuff sounds ugly to a lot of people, but I can't help it. Amen. I, I, I woke up on the ugly, ugly side of the world, trying to be beautified with salvation right now. So God says only believe. And then we'll turn around and try to put more mustard and ketchup up on belief. This is a, a plain sandwich. It don't need nothing added to it. Because one of the hardest things you're ever going to do in your life is really raise, allow the faith of God to work in you. That's a job in itself. You're fighting all the elements around you just to do that. And so, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, some people, you know, I don't eat pork. 
I don't preach against pork, but I don't eat pork. Okay? Some people will tell you that if you eat pork, it's an abomination to God. And there are scriptures in there that, that says that those people under that law could not eat. Could, could, well, see, here's the thing, though. Is, as I said before, we pick and choose the pieces we want to believe in. Them. So myself, I just leave it all on so I can eat chitlins. I can eat chitlins and still be thankful. You know, and thanking God for every bite of it. And then there are those that feel like, well, I, I'm, I, I'm, I want to be close to God, so I'm just going to eat salads. But they hate the neighbors. <laughs> but they hate the neighbors. Now, I know scripture that everything God made is good. Everything he made is good. Matter of fact, in, in uh, the Bible says in, in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, there is nothing from without a man. In other words, there's nothing outside of you that can get in you, that can defile you. Defilement doesn't come from what goes in. Defilement comes from what comes out of you. And there's a lot of things that you will eat. It may not be good for you, but thank God for the mercy. That's why I call it bowels of mercy. Oh, no, no. No, this, this is, no, this is, that's the reason why he says that. That's the reason why he said it because, and I ain't trying to be gross, but I'm going to tell you right now, every time that you have to have a movement like that, you, you are experiencing the mercy of God because if it wasn't for that, you'd be dead. All right? You will die. You won't, you won't even last a month. You, you, matter of fact, you probably wouldn't even, no, I don't think you'd last a month. So that's why he says, when you love people, you love them with the bowels of mercy. Yeah. Now, can you see that on your Valentine card? Honey, I love you with all my bowels. Uh-oh. You're not going to get too many responses from that. Matter of fact, you may get a cutoff. Change your address and no forwarding address and no telephone numbers. But the Bible uses those terms because of, of ways that you might understand what he's trying to tell you. And, and, and so you see many times that many... First thing we look at, how many people say, no, I ain't perfect. <laughs> Based on what? See that? See that? Because you, in your mind, said you wasn't, and then God said that you are. Now, who's lying? Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Be ye perfect, for I am. If I am in him as he is, so are. Well, well, we, we, we got a community here. So are we. <laughs> We all are in the same one. Okay. Yeah, well, he, even, let me tell you something. He, I don't, if they got his name, I'm going to believe they're in him irregardless. You know, I got a bad toenail too. <laughs> but it's on me. You know, I got one toenail, never grow right, won't grow right, but it's on me. Okay, so, but it's still a part of the body. Oh, the Bible talks about the unseemly parts. It's talking about those parts you have to give more attention to. Everything in the body ain't pretty. You know, most people, that's why they cover their head because they don't want to show their head. They just want to show their face, you know. And then sometimes they want to cover the face up. But there are things in us, there are things in the body that may not look good because it says in the, in the house, there's going to be all kinds of vessels. It's not just one kind. There's all kinds of vessels. So 
But what we realize is that that's one that called, that's one self-same spirit that work in one works in all. All oh, praise God. And so in, in 1 Timothy 4 and 4, it says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Then we get into the place of death. Now, look this way again. Would you say that one of your greatest fears right now is dying? Just, just look this way. Don't worry about it. You ain't got to answer. Don't let your neighbor know that. And 90%, 99.9% of people living on planet Earth right now, church-wise, their greatest fear is dying. You know what the Bible says about that? That they that fear death gets locked up in the bondage. Because you always be trying to figure out death. But if you understood Jesus, then you'd understand life. Right? Because Jesus did not come to give you death, but he came to give you life. And the life more abundantly. But what happened is that we are still trying to define death and not trying to understand life. And what we need more than anything is to realize that Jesus didn't come to offer anybody death. Uh-oh. He didn't. He came to offer life. That's his choice. That's, it wasn't a choice. He said, come unto me. I'm going to give you life. Uh, not just life, but life and that more abundantly. Most of us in Christ today still have not reached the level of abundant living in Christ. It's because it's a fearful thing to explore. Because what happened, his life is so much greater than what you know life to be. And what we've done is spend our time trying to work on a life that we think it ought to be instead of receiving the light that God has for you. And if you receive that light, then you have the right to go to God and say, you know what, I, I want more abundance of this. See, the more we fix the old life, you know, we'll get abundance of mess. <laughs> and we think that we keep working on it, it's going to get better. It just gets worse. You keep doing stuff. God, I'm going to do this. You know, I, well, I'm, first year I'm going on a diet. February, I'm off the diet. Try it again next year. We're always working on the dead man and not realizing that there's an abundant life that God can give you that is bigger than that. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't care if you had to walk down the street with signs on the side that says, wide low, but you're happy in Jesus. I mean, abundant life. I mean, ask yourself, these are not things, I'm not just teaching this just to teach it, but I'm teaching it because these are things you need to ask God about. Lord, you said, you said that you're going to give me life and, and life more abundant. Lord, what is this abundant life? How do I tap into this abundant life? I understand what living is and exists, and I've been here for 61 years, so I know what life is here. But I need something to top beyond where I've ever been. I need something that's, that I can't muster up, I can't fix, I can't work on, but it happened. It flows to me because I'm receiving his abundant life. Oh, praise God. See, life is like a, an open book test. I used to love him in school. And his word teaches us how to live in what we call a diplomatic immunity. See, because we are ambassadors. We represent a new nation, a new country. We are ambassadors of heaven. And in an ambassador, I don't know whether you know this or not, but I'm just going to say it anyway. When they come from overseas, they do what they want to do. They can't even, you can't mess with them. You stop the car, he pulled the badge, I'm a diplomat. Okay. 
And don't let them get into embassy. You can't even go and arrest them. That's when they had that big problem in the Catholic Church. You know, the, the pedophiles and all that. And they really couldn't go and arrest not one priest. They cannot go into one Catholic church and arrest not one priest. Did you know that? You know why? Every Catholic church is an embassy. And they have diplomatic status. And the only way they could quieten America down is they had to turn one over to America to send them to court. But otherwise, they can't touch them. Because the Vatican is not just a city, it's a country. You know what determines a country? You have to be able to print your own money, have your own constitution, and the Vatican have all that. And so you're not, you cannot go into a Catholic embassy and arrest the priest. The other, and you can't go into a Jewish synagogue and get a rabbi. All those are embassies. All those people have what they call ambassador status, diplomatic diplomacy. And so we, 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 we have, we, we, you know, we, God teaches us how to live in this present world. That's why I become very fearful when I see a lot of Christians get so involved in politics. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying be ignorant of politics. I, I try to learn a little bit about everything. But I hate it when I see Christians trying to use the political uh, uh, machine to bring about a godly cause. I have a problem because you can't sign enough petitions. You can't sign enough. You can't march with enough signs. That is not the life that Jesus came to give us. If we were living the abundant life, we wouldn't carry a sign and we wouldn't need to sign a petition because we would be changing our world. The world, you know why the world don't want what we have? Because we're living like they're living. And some of them is beating us. And so they really don't, what, there is no real, uh, allure or anything enticing for them to come to church and, and, and be in church and, and do those things except for maybe to a relief of their conscience, maybe for a week, for a day, feeling bad, go to church, get it over with, okay, praise God, I'll see you in the mañana. But if we understood the life that Jesus gave us, then we would exemplify that life. It, because if you notice Jesus, not one time did he ever talk about the Romans. Did you know they had abortion that day? He never mentioned abortion. And that, theirs is a lot gruesome than now. Because when they didn't want a baby, you know what they done? They just threw them over the wall. And the wild dogs would eat them at night. So, but Jesus never mentioned it. Did you ever read it anywhere where he said that? Not one time did. They had about every political problem because we still got the same system that Rome had then. We got it now. And so he not one time ever came up. He never spoke against Caesar. He just said one thing. You know what he said? Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. But render unto God the things that belong to God. Living in this world. You know what? As long as you live in this world, you should pay, you're going to pay taxes. I ain't paying no taxes. Had some preacher friends, man, say, man, no, I'm an ambassador. I ain't paying no taxes. I said, that's okay. We got prison ministries too. <laughs> yeah. They got prison ministries. You ain't got to worry about that. Don't pay taxes. Maybe God needs you not to pay taxes so you can go in and minister. <laughs> but as for me, I'm going to pay the taxes. Okay? No problem. I ain't mad. They were doing it when I came here. They're probably doing it when I leave. So there's certain things, you know, we, we're getting involved. Too many Christian people trying to get involved in things of the earth instead of trying to get involved in things of heaven so we can change the things on earth. You, don't, you can't change earth, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can bring a change from heaven that can change earth. But as long as you're getting involved and entangled, and once again, I'm not saying that you can't say nothing. I, I, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to tell you that you can't voice your opinion because even Paul Voice his opinion. There was a time when he appealed to the Romans. 
when his brothers was going to destroy him, he said, I want to see, I got to see the season. And because of that, he, his appeal took him by way of Rome, but not knowing that God needed him to go to Rome anyway. Right? So, uh, one of the things we need, you know, we talked about the word of God coming to you and you hearing the word of God and, and understanding that sometimes we live by feelings, I know. We, 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 we shouldn't, but we have a lot. I, our feelings have a lot to do with what we do, you know. Oh, sometimes I feel blue and I dress in blue. You know, I mean... Our feelings have a lot to do with what we do. Uh, you know, and, and you're not going to divorce yourself from that. You know, I ain't going to, you know, a certain co color cars I just don't even like. I wouldn't even buy one unless it was cheap. I don't have a feeling for that. Okay, so there's certain things we have feelings for. But in 1 John, he says, try the, no, the spirits. I tried to look it up on my computer. I kept saying it ain't in there. I didn't realize that was a poor word. It didn't say try the, spirit, try the spirits and then see whether they be of God or not. And most Christians today will take the first thing down the pipe. They never gauge it by God. It's just that thought came, that must be God. Yeah, and, and not only that, I was being consecrated. One of, one of the easiest and one of the most dangerous places to be sometimes is in a time of consecration. Now, some of you are going, now listen to what I'm saying now. Once you begin to cut back, like in fasting, fasting is it's good, but can be dangerous for you if you're not really locked in, okay? Because you are becoming more aware of spiritual influence. You notice when the devil came to Jesus? When he was, yeah. Because spiritually, he wanted to invoke a seed that he had invoked it before. And we're more susceptible to seeds when we're like that. Only thing, you better make sure you're getting the right seed. The devil came, not only did he come, but he came packing word. If thou be. And he hasn't changed. He'll still do the same thing to Christian people today. Well, if you are saved, <laughs> then you ought to. And you'll say, yeah, that's got to be God. That's got to be God. Because, but what Jesus done, he kept putting right back the word. You know, if you be the son of God, turn this bread, turn these stones to bread. He said, no, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, many of us said, we've been down there fasting, praying, trying to make stones turn to bread just so we can satisfy our hunger for a moment. It wasn't going to feed our spirit, but it would definitely make my old man feel good. You know what I'm saying? Because when I'm hungry, food does make me feel, don't do nothing for my spirit, though. I try to make it, do. But I'll be licking my lips like it's, mm, honey in a rock. You know what I'm saying? I'll be, thinking that it's doing something to my, my spirit, but it ain't. You know, sometimes it's so good to make me want to speak in tongues, but it ain't doing nothing for my spirit. I'm saying I like good food, but I'm just saying it ain't doing nothing for my spirit. So we have to know, that's why I say if you don't know who you are and you go into these type of dedication and get into these type of things, you may hear some things that sound reasonable and logical, but it's not God. You have to remember who you are in him. If thou be, no, no, ain't no if I am. I am. Well, if you are, and then, you know, then, you know, try the spirit. First thing people come to you, well, if, if you're a saint, Sister Wilson, you, you shouldn't have that scarf on. <laughs> Why? 
Where did that come from? Huh? Where did that come from? Did that come from God? No. But, but you're not knowing because it sounded like they may have a point. And so what you do, well, you know, I ain't no word it's God no more because God don't like it. Did God tell you that? Huh? I want God to talk to me about my scarf. If it, tell me that my hat, if he don't want me to wear a black cap, tell me, don't wear a black cap. But I promise you I won't wear a black cap. There's a lot of things, you know, personally for me, that I feel God told me. He didn't tell you. He didn't tell me to tell you. He told me. He told me. So all I can do is live out what he told me. And if you are able to live with God and you're happy and he's happy, then I ain't got no business coming here raining on your picnic. Hey Amen. That, you know, at, at many years, man, I ain't, I wouldn't even put on a pair of Bermuda shorts. I didn't want nobody going crazy on my legs. Hmm? Bermudas? Okay, Bermudas. Same thing. You know? I wouldn't even put on I wouldn't even put on a pair of them because you know why? They said, you ain't supposed to put them on. Well, then I see Pete out here in the in the water. He ain't naked. Huh? No, no, here's the thing, if, if it's, one thing about it, if Jesus was there and he would have thought something was wrong with Peter's attire, he would have mentioned that. He would have mentioned that. Well, when they say naked, I don't mean, I don't mean he was birthday suit, but you know what I'm saying. they like David danced out of his clothes. Everybody say, well, David was naked. No, no, he took off his identification. He took off the king robe because he met a king greater than he was. And he danced out of his robe and became like everybody else. And his, you know, his wife got all mad. And when the, you out there, you don't base yourself, you don't lord yourself. You, what's wrong with you, man? You so silly. But David understood, said, where were you when I was in the sheep coat? Where were you at then? See, God was with me in a sheep coat. And if he was with me when I was in a sheep coat, why won't I now? I don't want to, I ain't going to come to God telling him how great I am. If I was the president of the United States of America, I'd take my president's suit off. Because it means nothing to God. And, and so where was that? All right. <laughs> Y'all yeah, got me way out there. I didn't mean to go out there. But, but life becomes a test. It, it becomes a big test. And, 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 and God is trying to build confidence. Each choice that we make has like a domino effect on many people around us. You know, it's one thing, do you read the Bible, think the Bible, or do you live the Bible? See, that, that's a big difference. Many people read it. A lot of people think it. But it's another thing to live it. It's another thing for the word as the word is manifested in flesh. Once that word is manifested in us, it should produce. Remember, see potential. Let me get this fear from down here because that ain't, I don't want you to think this potential fear. It's not. But that word, see planted in us, potential. Everything God's going to be in your life was the inception of him in your life, he brought it all with him then. He's not coming with a layaway program. How you pay on it all year to get it at the end of the year. You got it all up front. So you can live it out. You know, I, I wish they'd had it so in America where you get all your pension at 18. And if you live to be 65, now you got to go to work. <laughs> now, now, that's the way it ought to be. Let me get mine up front. 
Because what happened, they make you work till you get about six to five, seven years old, and then you got about a few years to draw, and they done made a lot of money off of you. But if they gave me my money up front, see, then I could have been living, taking it easy when I turned 65, looking forward to being 65 so I can go to work. Well, that, that's the way we treat God, though. That's, that's the way we treat God. Because we don't believe he gave us everything up front. And so what we're doing is, is trying to break off and, and win a little piece here and get a little piece here. Mom, try to get some more next week. I'm going to try to get. No. No. He gave it to you up front. Everything you need in this life, not just in this life. He gave you everything, not only in this life, but the next. He gave it to you right up front. But we have this idea on installment plans. We got salvation on installment plans. You know, well, he saved me. Okay. Then one of these days, he going to heal me. One of the days, he's going to deliver me. One of the days, he's going to prosper me. All, all, all these things we have put, not knowing, saved, mean all. It, didn't, it wasn't an installment plan. Well, I know, he, I, know, I know he saved me, but, but what? But what? There is no but what in God. None. He meant exactly what he said. Praise God. And then when, when we read places like in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, he told them, you know, go. He breathed on them, sent them out. He said, go, heal the sick, cleanse the leopards, raise the dead, cast out devils. Notice what he said, though. Huh? Free? He did say free, didn't he? Because somebody tell me what free is. Any of y'all ever experienced free? No payment? Not even a little bit of payment? That's why when they call me on my phone and tell me about the free gift I just received. <laughs> I told them, if you got my number, I know you got my address. Because if it's free, that's almost like us preaching the gospel. It's free, but come over here. Let me tell you now what you got to do now. Oh, wait a minute. If it's free, it's free. Everybody said free. free. Thank you. Now, if it's free, it's free. He said, how did you get it? You got it free? Then he said, if you got it free, then how are you going to give it now? Free. That's a whole nother lesson now. I can see that. That's a whole nother lesson now. Because, see, that's, you're going to have to let that kind of like marinate. Because hardest thing for a Christian to believe is that he gave it freely. And he expects you to do the same thing he done to you to do it for somebody else. If he gave it to you free, then guess what you do? You give it free. How, mu how much does his forgiveness cost you? Let me, let, let me move off of that. Let's, 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 let's keep moving. And so he says in James, he said, And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. If he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults. We ain't got that say. Uh-oh. What, what did he say? Confess your fault once in a why? So that you may be what? Huh? See, we don't have 
that type of relationship in the body of Christ. And we wonder why nobody can get healed in Christ. And you wonder why people cannot get delivered in Christ. And you wonder why we produce a hypocrite and not a saint. And the reason why is because, be honest with you, if you got a problem, <laughs> you better not tell nobody. What? Oh, God, no! Huh? <laughs> but I'm just saying, though, it, 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 it's, the, it's the thing, though, this is scripture. Confess your fault one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And you, it looks like there's a link here. And if we cannot talk to each other, then who are you going to talk to? And what is scary, and that's what's so scary, is that you can be around people forever and, and, and they, everybody's afraid of everybody. And the reason why they're afraid of everybody is because they, they paid more for their salvation than you did. If it was all free, then it was all free. But what happened in religion is we think that some of us feel like, well, I paid more for mine than they did. Uh, it cost me a whole lot more to be saved. No, it didn't cost you nothing. No, it didn't cost you nothing. It didn't cost you not one red penny. But somehow, because we have that spirit about us, it feels like somehow, uh, what well, I've been through more than they've been through, so they got to go through some stuff. Oh, God, help us. Oh, help us. That's why the Bible says the affection of fervent prayer of a righteous man. Of hell is what? Man, we better get some righteousness back in the church then. And you know what righteousness cannot come by works. It can only come by faith. If our prayers are going to be powerful, if our prayers are going to be fervent, it's going to be because we became righteous. And you're not going to get right. You're going to believe into righteousness. There's nothing you're going to do to get yourself right. Made people mad with that one. Well, you need to get right with God. Tell me how to get right there. Tell me. I don't know no place in this Bible that give you any kind of formula where you're going to say, if I do this, 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 and this, now I'm right. No. My faith is what makes me right. And if I can believe God, then my faith is going to produce the righteousness that he says I have. It's a relationship thing. Yes. Yeah. No. Let me stop that. Let me stop that again. Again. What we don't want to do is put the cart before the horse. Uh, that's a horse. That's a horse in third world country. <laughs> you know when we say that, show you just, and, and, I, and I'm glad you said it because every time this thing comes up, the first thing people want to do. You'll never understand how his life is until you die to yours. All right? So when you make a statement like that, well, or, or say, well, you can do anything you want to do, well, you always could. That, 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 that has never changed. God came, that never changed. But that's the reason why when we talk about his life versus your life, see, what you're trying to do is protect your life. What he's trying to do is give you his life. And so the reason why you, the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, if we just do anything, no, you, you ain't going to want to do anything. It ain't going to work like that. You get him, I promise you, if he started living his life and he started living his life like he wants to live his life, you ain't going to even want to do half the things you think you might do, scared of yourself. But the fear, uh-oh, that seed, I, I did, 
I didn't want to leave you with a negative thing on it. But the fear that people have placed in people's mind, the religious fears they have placed in people's mind, is what makes them make the statement, well, well, that means you can do anything you want to do. You're telling people, I ain't telling you to do anything. You look here. If God can't tell you what to do, I, what business do I have trying to tell you what to do? I didn't pay for you. you I ain't pay. I ain't laid down my life for nobody. Not yet. Yeah, I don't really have any plans of that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what changes everything. It's just like now. Now. I, I'm, hey, we got on this, but we left. Now, let's just say all those that said they're doing everything they're supposed to do. Could you explain one thing to me? What, what is, uh, when the last time he even laid hands on himself and got healed? Huh? I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just being straight up. I mean, you're telling me you, you this right? And you can't even pray, you can't even get a prayer through. I would have to think that if my doing was my righteousness, then I better do a whole lot more than I'm doing. Uh-uh. Yeah, you need you you need you need to throw all your magazines away, get out the TV set, and, and quit cooking, and go on you some fast and get some stuff together so you can have some stuff working in your life. Because if you're that right with God and God is that pleased with your life, there should be something happening in your life. That's the why when Peter and John, when they came, seen the lame man laying at the gate, he was impotent, lame. He said, "Uh." Look on us. And he looked up at him, trying to get some of that corner stuff. He said, man, we ain't got no silver gold. We ain't got none. Today, we're just the opposite. We'll try to buy our way in. We'll try to pay it in. He said, silver and gold, we ain't got none, but such as we have. I wish the church could get back to the place where we can tell the world, silver and gold, we ain't got that. But what we do have, we freely can give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so he said, but this man standing here is not standing here by our holiness. No, it's his holiness. And see, when we get rid of our holiness and get his holiness, because his holiness works a whole lot different than ours. Our was changed from time to time. It changed from culture to culture. Our holiness changed even in the United States. You know, you go some places, you can't do this. You go to other places, you can't do that. I'm trying to figure out now who's going to be saved. Organization I'm in, they split up over the TV. Who can preach on TV? So if you preach on TV, one group says, you ain't saved. That same group, that same group, that organ over TV had the same argument over the radio. Now, I know, you know, study church history in America alone, and it baffles your mind because, and I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle anything, but I'm just saying, it all starts with you and him, all right? You're not working your way to get him. You're working your way out of him because he got you. Does that make sense? All right, but we want to try and figure out, like the rich young ruler, master, good master, what good thing? Oh God, what good thing can I do to inherit the kingdom? Now, if you ask God what you can do, He'll tell you, but you can't do it. <laughs> and that's all. If you ask him what you can do, he'll tell you. But you can't do it. And so, 
The little dude beat his chest like Tarzan for a moment. Oh, bless God, since I've been a boy, I ain't none of that. He said, well, I got one more thing for you. Go and say everything you got. Give it to the poor, then come on back. Self-preservation. You know what I'm saying? We'll die to a lot of things, but not to ourselves. If he had went on and done that, laid on down there, he would have found out that the Lord says, you know, no man has given, has left wife, houses, land, whatever, that I ain't going to give them back a hundredfold even in this lifetime. He could have gave up all that and had a hundred times more, but he couldn't give up that because God knows. When it comes down to it, as the devil told, told, as the devil told God in Job's case, Skin for skin. A man is seek to save himself. That's that devil's thing. Save yourself. But I heard Jesus said, no, I ain't got to save myself. I got a joy set before me. There's a joy set before me. I ain't trying to save myself. There's something at the end of this thing. And I see the joy that's presented can allow me to take the cross, take the beating, take the crown, because for the joy that's set before him. God bless you this morning. I'm sorry I, I got carried away.